Now, in the war on terror, Kenya has had to fight two battles simultaneously. As the Kenya Defense Forces take on Al-Shabaab militants, the Kenyan society has also been struggling to contain radicalization that lures Kenyan youth into joining the terror group and executing acts of terror. KTN's Dennis Onsarigo now takes a look at the face of radicalization. Smarting from an increased number of terror attacks, the latest being an attack on a Kenyan military camp in Somalia. The Kenyan security forces can now breathe a sigh of relief, albeit for some time. The government appears to have stemmed the tide of terror attacks on its soil. There haven't been any serious uh, explosions or attacks since the Garissa massacre. And that's a step in the right direction. But the government is yet to find a lasting solution to what at first appeared as a foreign problem. Radicalization of Kenyan youth to join the Somali-based Al-Shabaab has now become a homegrown problem. Hundreds of youth, in fact thousands, have already been radicalized as successive governments look the other way. The numbers rapidly growing at the end of 2006. 2006 saw the fall of the Islamic Courts Union, a ragtag militia that challenged the transition of federal government in Somalia. ICU was crushed at the end of that year and later regrouped, giving birth to the present day Al Shabaab. But unknown to Kenyans, hundreds of Kenyan youth were enlisted to fight alongside the transition of federal government. When the ICU fell to the Somali government, the young men fled back into Kenya but were not wanted. A government clampdown forced them back into Somalia. Those who survived hampered hard feelings, turning them into radicals. Ken Ouko, a psychology lecturer at the University of Nairobi, says the government has been approaching the radicalization problem the wrong way. It's wrong. You know, the way we do it is like we are targeting a specific group of people. We end up engaging in what we are saying we want to do. We are profiling specific uh, characters in terms of religion, in terms of even appearance. You have cases where you are taught to believe that any bearded guy in some kanzu is a dangerous character. So you find women or even men saying, I'm not taking that flight because that guy is on it. The minute we do that, these guys start feeling ostracized. It did affect them at all, a lot. And people are asking, hey, what's going on? We are the victims as well. Why are we being incarcerated? Why are our youth disappearing? Why are we not getting an explanation? Why are we having this spate of assassinations? And who is doing it? And even if the government has not done it, the government has got the responsibility of explaining to us where they have gone. Religious scholars, on the other hand, paint a picture of governments around the world taking shortcuts in stopping their tracks, those undergoing radicalization. We're giving them too much publicity. Um, we're giving them too much footage. We're giving, we, um, and that is how they thrive and how they survive. Um, by making sure that they are on the spotlight all the time, uh, their every move is being covered. But the government faces even more an appeal task, changing the belief system of those already radicalized. Whatever is being called radicalization is actually a clean slate process of cleaning up the mind of the innocent individual, implanting doubt and frustration and ways out. And when they do this, what they're offering is not actually a radical individual. They're offering an individual who's frustrated, is being given an option, an alternative life. And that's what the rest of us are calling radicalization, but they're being taught how to reason afresh. Living together, coexisting, is one of the core principles of Islam. But because they don't understand that, and they were showing tunnel vision type of Islam, and they only see that and through that tunnel, and they don't see the rest in 99.99.9 percent of Islam, then we consider those yeah, they are the representative of Islam. The truth of the matter is they are as ignorant as anyone else about Islam. Security agencies have also failed to keep track on a number of youngsters rescued from radicalization centers because of erratic transfer of police officers who already know 
the faces of these youngsters. Absolutely. We can, want, we can, we can win this war if we only present the right education. When you talk about radicalization, these are the same guys who have grown up knowing that there are people like Menahem Begin of Israel, uh, Yasser Arafat of Palestine, uh, Nelson Mandela of South Africa, who have always been on that world-wanted list of criminals and terrorists, but they turned out to be great statesmen. So you're talking about a young person who reads history, and then he looks, for example, at Anwar Sadat in Egypt. And Anwar Sadat, I think, was on number three on the list of the U.S. one most wanted terrorists. The guy became a president for 30 years. You know, and he ran Egypt so well. For now, turning the tide on the numbers of those already radicalized and eradicalizing them is what the government is grappling with as terror attacks take a backseat. Denis Sarigo, KTN News. Right, and now we want to speak to John Alenam, who is the CEO of Africa and Sunset, but also a long-time investigative journalist who covered terror attacks uh, right here in the country and, of course, beyond. Uh, Namu, thank you very much for joining us. As we, of course, uh, wait to, um, of course, commemorate the events of uh, 2nd of April 2015, have we gotten to terms in, uh, in regards to knowing exactly what happened, where the lapses that were, what is it that, you know, the security forces missed? No, um, I've been speaking to a number of people who are close to the investigation and who've been following the case, and there, have, there has been some breakthrough around the kind of information that was delivered up to, uh, through security channels to the, the, the directorate of criminal investigations. It would appear from some of these sources, yet to confirm 100%, that there was a lot of information around the fact that there would be an attack. This is something that has come out as a public narrative, that um, information had even reached members of Garissa University that there would be an attack um, not very specific in nature but it would be targeting institutions of higher learning that case seems to be proceeding well uh, the number of uh, witnesses that have been brought against the people who are arrested the four individuals seem to have uh, made their, uh, their, their taken their, their pleas and given their testimonies on the same so with regard to the legal um, framework around that case there seems to be some go forward why I say no is because there are a lot of questions around whether lessons have been learned after that very brutal attack um, on April the 2nd, which we're commemorating tomorrow. Um, the, in northeastern Kenya, um, that it can be said that there have been some lessons or at least some learning points with the government listening to um, the pleas of members of parliament from that region and governors from that region, having Kenyan Somalis police um, some parts of that region, therefore being able, at least in terms of culture and language, to be able to get over a barrier that had been uh, something quite serious for the police. But um, the Al-Shabaab uh, cannot be said to be completely defeated. There have been a number of uh, attacks and, and incursions um, in the recent past. They have been able to move with um, relative freedom of all the way down from Lamu up to different parts of Wajir and Garissa. And in, this is in spite of Operation Linda Boni, as well as some of the other security operations um, on that side of the Kenya-Somalia border. So there still are quite a number of questions. And a thing that people miss, often miss about the fact that there are no attacks is that Al-Shabaab seems to be focusing a lot of its energies on trying to disrupt the, the Somali election that is said to be coming up this year and disrupt the politics there. So in that sense, Al-Shabaab seems to be a very malleable force that um, in terms of intelligence, we might not be 100% um, in terms of trying to um, stop them or truncate some of their movements within the country. Betty. Right. Thank you very much, John Alanamu, for your thoughts on this one. Of course, like I mentioned, tomorrow, Katie, will be having wall-to-wall -wall coverage of uh, the anniversary of uh, that uh, horrible and uh, terrible terror attack that took place uh, last year at the Garissa University.